Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to Session Fartuk-73. In our last episode, the party cleared the gilded tomb of the Canon of Omar. A strange artifact was discovered, identifying the tomb and causing a great deal of consternation for Tyra, who was clearly upset at hearing the name. We rejoin the party as she relays to them some background information on the occupant of the tomb. The group watched as Tyra made her way out of the chamber and back into the hallway, quickly followed by Geldor and the others. Whoa, 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 Tyra. Hold up, my dear. Now, my memory's a bit fuzzy on the old priest and Sedgwick. Is that the place they all died of the plague a few years back? No, screamed the woman as fear and anguish flooded across her face. It was not the plague, it was the cannon. He poisoned the souls of the people who lived there. As she took a defiant stance, causing the miner to lift his hands and surrender. Lady Irena calmly approached the woman and held her for a few moments until she calmed down. In soft tones, she asked for Tyra to tell them more about the canon of Omar individual. Taking a place on the floor, Tyra sat and attempted to compose herself. The others gathered around her and waited patiently for her recitation of the story. After several minutes of silent sobbing, she began the tale. Years ago, when I was a small child, I lived in a village called Sedgwick. It was mostly farmers and general laborers. We weren't rich, we usually had enough food, and everyone was generally happy. Our lives were simple and nice until, until he came as a shadow passed over her face. As our village grew, it garnered the attention of people wanting to be happy like us. One day, a new priest arrived, Horus the pious. He was from the city of Omar and was a traveling minister. At first, he gave speeches about the serpent god and no one paid much attention. But over the course of several weeks, more and more of his worshippers came into our town and became vehement in their religious fervor and support. They recruited people and merchants. Those that wouldn't adhere to the teachings of Horus were blackballed. Their businesses failed or they were refused service. The town became split with everyone choosing sides. Our happy community was being torn apart by the teachings of this, this pig. The violence didn't start until my uncle decided to refuse service to the followers of the serpent god. My uncle stood up the angry voices and told them that the town was founded on cooperation and their opinions were not the opinions shared by the people of Sedgwick. I was young, but I remember the anger of the serpent worshippers. My father and other uncles stood with their brother against the cultists. But one day, one day it all came to a head. The group watched as the pain swept across the woman's face and gave her time to compose herself. Tears flowed freely down her face as the memories came back to her before she sniffled and continued. One day, the future canon of Omar came to my uncle's shop to ask him why he had declined service to his worshippers. I was young and don't remember much of the conversation, but I remember the anger of my father and his brothers. The priest was alone and taunted them, but they were good men and they didn't fall for his tricks. Horus was sent away. Later that night, my uncle's shop burned to the ground. Witnesses spotted robed acolytes running from the scene and caught them. My uncles and his brothers beat the cultists to death in the streets that night. As they gave the cultists their just desserts, Horus arrived with a large contingent of supporters. I guess the fire was done to provoke my uncle, and it had worked. Horus had his people surround my father and his brothers. As more of the regular citizens arrived, they spotted my relatives with blood on their hands and dead cultists at their feet. Horus declared that my father and his brothers were murderers and needed to be punished. The cultists jumped them and savagely beat my uncle and his brothers before 
Her voice cracked and tears continued to flow with the memories. Sister Elaine put a hand on the woman's shoulder, but it was pushed away so that she could finish the story. They took my father and my uncles outside of town to a grove of trees. They were hung by ropes from the trees and set, set, they were set on fire. Their screams were horrible and my mother tried to cover my ears, but the sound pierced my head. Horace and his followers banished my mother and the rest of our family. He declared that we were the evil element in Sedgwick and needed to leave or be cleansed of our evil. The mob followed us to our house and allowed my mother to only get what was needed. When she took too long, they set our home on fire. We were ushered out of town with a bag of food and the clothes on our back. Many members of the mob had turned on us, had once been our friends, good friends, people we had helped and people who had helped us. But they had changed thanks to the preachings of Horace of Omar. For one year we were outcasts and lived in a cave. My mother died. My siblings died. I nearly died. All because of a man in priest robes had poisoned a group of people who couldn't think for themselves. Canon of Omar. Pfft. He was an evil man that rose to power on the backs of people who couldn't think for themselves. Horace played on the fears of others, irrational fears. He wasn't God-fearing, he was a fear-monger. Nothing more, nothing less. Over the years I grew up and watched as his cult took on more and more followers. Bullied people that had no hope. Stupid people that didn't understand. Weak people looking for something to believe in. Those were his followers. They were the ones that got him to his point in power. She sat silently, trying to wipe away the tears, and was silent for several minutes. The group felt sad for her and her family, and stood by, ready to comfort her when she was ready. Bulger moved first and headed back to the chamber. The group heard a clang as the urn was overturned, and a noise of fluid hitting the flagstone echoed through the chamber. While not completely certain of the circumstances going on, they all had an idea of what Bolger was doing. A few minutes later, the squat gnome returned and was securing his britches. Piss on that guy, replied Bolger. I don't need his blood money. Sister Elaine shook her head at the former sailor's action, but said nothing. The others voiced their contempt for the man's actions and also supported the kind woman. She rubbed the mucus from her nose and stood back. No she said defiantly. It is blood money, but it is time to give that blood money a useful purpose. Let us loot the room. You've earned it, she said. Fargus cleared his throat and nodded to his companions. <clears throat> you heard her. Let's get to work prying up these stones. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures of Philbar, thanks for listening.